Now let's talk about the types of attacks that you might be dealing with as ethical hacker yourself. So now we're going to be talking about the types of attacks. Now, one type of attack that you'll find common, particularly in cases of hacktivism, for example, or cases where people are trying to make a particular point or just be a general pain, is this idea of defacing. Now, defacing goes back for quite a while. It's the idea of sort of digital graffiti where you've left your mark or your imprint behind so that everybody knows you were there. Primarily a website thing, and it's really just making alterations to something that used to be pretty common a long time ago. Now, it's very particular for businesses or people or just organizations in general to have their home pages be replaced by this other thing that was along the lines of, hey, I was here and I took over your web page. We also have a pretty common one, which certainly has been common over the years, and it's a pretty good path towards quality exploits and high profile vulnerabilities, and that's buffer overflow. Now, a buffer overflow is a result of the way programs are stored in memory. When programs are running, they make use of a chunk of memory called a stack. And it's just like a stack of plates when you put a bunch of plates down. When you pull a plate off, you're going to pull the top plate. You're not going to pull the oldest plate. You're going to pull the one that was on the top. So the same thing with the stack here. We're accessing memory, and this has to do with the way functions are called in memory. When you call a function, a chunk of memory gets thrown on top of the stack, and that's the chunk of memory that gets accessed. And you've got a piece of data in memory within that stack, and that's called a buffer. And when too much data is sent and tried to put into the buffer, it can overflow. Now, the bounds of the configured area for that particular buffer, it can overflow the bounds of the configured area for that particular buffer. Now, the way stacks are put together, we end up with a part of the stack where the return address from the function is stored. So when you overflow the buffer, you have the ability to potentially override that return, at which point you can control the flow of execution of programs. And if you can control the flow of execution of the program, you can insert code into that memory that could be executed. And that's where we get buffer overflow that turns into exploits that creates the ability to get like a command shell or some other useful thing from the system where the buffer overflow is running. So that's a buffer overflow in short. Sometimes we also have format string attacks and sometimes these can be precursors to buffer overflow formats. Now format strings come about because the C programming language makes use of these format strings that determines how data is going to be input or output. So you have a string of characters that define whether the subsequent input or output is going to be an integer or whether it's going to be a character or whether it's going to be a string or a floating point, that sort of thing. So you have a format string that defines the input or the output. Now, if a programmer leaves off the format string and just gets lazy and provides only the variable that's going to be output, for example, you have the ability to provide that format string. If you provide that format string, what then happens is the program starts picking the next piece of data off the stack and displays them because that way we can start looking at data that's on the stack of the running program just by providing a format string. And if I can look at the data, I may be able to find information like a return address or some other useful piece of information. There is also a possibility of being able to inject data into the stack. I may be able to find some information like a return address or some other useful piece of information. There is also a possibility of being able to inject data into the stack. I may be able to find some information like a return address or some other useful piece of information. There is also a possibility of being able to inject data into the stack using this particular type of attack. Now moving on to our next type of attack is a denial of service. A denial of service, this is a pretty common one and you'll hear about this a lot. This is not to be confused though with the one that I'll be talking about after this, and that is a distributed denial of service. So this one that you see is a, this is a denial of service attack. And a denial of service is any attack or action that prevents a service from being available to its legitimate or authorized users. So you hear about a ping flood or a sin flood that is basically a sin packet being sent to your machine constantly or a smurf attack. And Smurf attack has to do something with ICMP echo requests and responses using broadcast addresses. That one's been pretty well shut down over the last several years. You can also get a denial of service simply from a malformed packet or a piece of data where a piece of data is malformed and sent into a program. Now, if the program doesn't handle it correctly, if it crashes, suddenly you're not able to use that program anymore. So therefore, you are denied the service of the program and thus the denial of service. 
Now, as I said, a denial of service is not to be confused with a distributed denial of service. And I know it's pretty trendy, particularly in the media, to call it any denial of service a DDoS or any denial of service a DDoS. Now, it's important to know that any denial of service is not a DDoS. A DDoS, or as you might know, a distributed denial of service, is a very specific thing. A distributed denial of service is a coordinated denial of service making use of several hosts in several locations. So if you think about a botnet as an example, a botnet could be used to trigger a distributed denial of service where I've got a lot of bots that I'm controlling from a remote location and I'm using all these bots to do something like sending a lot of data to a particular server. When I've got a lot of systems sending even small amounts of data, all of that data can overwhelm the server that I'm sending it to. So the idea behind a distributed denial of service attack is to overwhelm resources on a particular server in order to cause that server not to be able to respond. Now, the first known DDoS attack used a tool called Stockhold Rot, which is German for barbed wire. Now, Stockhold Rot came out of some work that a guy by the name of Mixter was doing in 1999. He wrote a proof of concept piece of code called TFN, which was the tribe flood network. Let me just show that for you. So you can see on the Wikipedia page that the tribe flood network or TFN is a set of computer programs that is used to conduct various DDoS attacks such as ICMP floods, SYN floods, UDP floods, and Smurf attacks. Now, I know many people don't really consider Wikipedia a really good source of any sort of knowledge, but it's a good place to start off. So if you want to read about all these types of attacks like ICMP floods and what exactly is a SYN flood, you can always do that from Wikipedia. It's not that bad a place. Of course, you shouldn't use Wikipedia as your final Rosetta Stone. Moving on. So this program called Old Rod, which was it was used to attack servers like eBay and Yahoo back in February of 2000. So that attack in February of 2000 was really the first known distributed denial of service attack, which is not to say that there weren't denial of service attacks previously. So to that, there were certainly plenty of them, but they were not distributed. Now, this means there weren't a lot of systems used to coordinate and create a denial of service condition, and therefore we get the distributed denial of service attack. So that's a handful of type of attacks and some pretty common attacks that you're going to see as an ethical hacker. When you become an ethical hacker, or if you're trying to become an ethical hacker, you should always know about these types of attacks. Subscribe to our channel for more insightful content on ethical hacking, cybersecurity, and digital defense strategies. Together, let's enhance our knowledge and contribute to a safer and more secure digital future.